information. Um, what happened to the what? To the that whistleblower or the, the, the person whistleblower. that that filmed um, that that video that everybody saw, and um, because there's also those policies that are putting uh, eco terrorists or mm -hmm. the, uh, calling environmental um, um, activists terrorists and labeling them under that that uh, terminology and then uh, treating them according to that. So. Yeah. Can um, I, uh, sorry, I just wanted to add one okay. question to that, just piggyback off of it, because I was wondering if you could maybe talk a little bit about sort of the general maybe cultural identity shifts that are happening with some of these kind of more commercial, um, or at least people being more open to certain commercial changes or how people are being reached, just in terms of also kind of like a, a broader American identity, because it, it, I was thinking about what you were talking about as a, um, sort of in a sense like Europe, Europeanizing uh, way people uh, shop and like there's certain kind of fears that people have with that, I think. Hmm. I guess I'm trying to make a connection to the idea that people are consuming less and that there's a certain fear towards that changing a certain kind of American ideal of you know, consumerism or um, just kind of abundance that goes along with that. There's a sense I was kind of thinking it might piggyback off the idea of um, degrowth and et cetera. Cool. Well, good questions. Um, I haven't heard of degrowth, so I'm yeah. Thanks, what is? I thanks for sharing that. Can you explain me. what that, what you mean by degrowth? What that is? It's uh, the opposite of growth. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> but. But I mean, how do you have any idea how that plays out in terms of either? Um, behavior, public policy, uh, 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 behavior. Yeah, definitely. It's uh, it's uh, of course consuming less, and for um, it's it's for a better quality of life. It's also working less for more time, more social time, and it's mm -hmm. a very integrated uh, philosophy. Right, yeah. right. So conceivably, this would be one of the solutions to the yeah. commons problem, right? Yeah, is less, right? Work less, Work do less. less, consume less, earn less, all of that. And be happier. Be, and be happier. Right. <laughs> no, happiness is a very important part. Right. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Right. More happiness, less stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I, I think I'm I I'm fascinated by um, and I'll I'll call it anti-growth um, activism. Um, it, it's the, David Brower, who is the um, the first executive director of the Sierra Club and kind of a uh, kind of the font the founder of the at least the modern political environmental movement, um, used to say that. Growth for the sake of growth is the philosophy of cancer. Uh, that obviously, if we keep on growing, it just it just it won't work. And one of the reasons why um, I was particularly interested in, in the tragedy of the commons, the metaphor here is around population. And one of the the startling things that happened just this week uh, was the United Nations released their revisions of their population uh, projections. And what had been taken as a very important state of, you know, of how we'll culturally move forward um, on the planet as humans trying to deal with ecological limitations, which is that we're going to get to about 9 billion people by the year 2050, um, but then we're going to, that, that's, that's the end of growth, that basically the, from that point the population will actually go down slightly, because by that point women's fertility rates will get lower, uh, and fertility in, in, in women is basically defined by having um, uh, one daughter or less. Uh, that, that rate will go down. Uh, so the, the human population will begin to um, stabilize, somewhere between 8 and 9 billion people. Well, the revisions that came out this week basically said that the population will probably get to about 10 billion people uh, and maybe as high as 15 billion people um, in, their, in, in their scenario planning, which begins to change, actually, a lot of the equations about whether we will have enough food uh, and ecological resources to survive. Um, so I think there's going to be a reaction to that from the formal environmental movement to actually get into um, some of the, I actually think, kind of um, ineffective population control um, conversations and frameworks that I, that, that's one of the things I, I very much disagree with in this. Um, if you, in my mind, looking at population as a, as a problem is completely the wrong way of doing it. A, a large population is a symptom of uh, women not having the status and rights that they need uh, and deserve. Uh, and dealing with that is the core problem. Talking about the population problem says, well, the ecology is the most important thing, and we have to solve that. Uh, so it's, it's a very environmental as opposed to sustainable or, or broader way of looking at, at it. 
So uh, all that's a long way of saying I'm, I'm really interested in, in, in degrowth. I don't ever talk about it in the, in the business context because business is based on velocity and growth. Um, if you look at people's stock prices, a very profitable company will have a declining stock price if it's not showing growth year over year. It's just the, it's the basic assumption in capitalism that things need to grow to survive. Um, so that, that's, that's the challenge. Um, so I, I guess I, I, I like it. Um, I haven't figured it out yet, and that's probably one of the uh, good things for us to start yeah, grappling absolutely. with. Absolutely. Um, uh, you asked what happened to the whistleblower. Um, that person actually was a, he was an employee of the um, Humane Society. So he, that was the, the person who actually really, so he was good. Yeah, he did his job. Um, and, and that's a very, I, you know, I love the type of people thing like the Yes Men are doing. Um, and uh, um, the Yes, are you guys familiar with the Yes Men? Yeah, it's great. They just did one recently where they, they went into a, um, uh, a wealthy Chicago suburb and um, said that there's a, a, a coal plant that's going to be at, um, installed there. And they just went nuts. Um, <laughs> and these are people who did not care about coal at all before that moment. Um, I, uh, you asked a question around cultural identities. And, and let me just get a little clarify. Are you, are you thinking, are you asking like what kind of cultural identities exist that see that frugality or simplicity at the core of them? Are, are those being formed? Uh, yeah, I guess, I guess just thinking about you know, sort of various questions. Uh, I guess, Jesus, that's always weird. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I guess I was just kind of making a connection to sort of, certainly in the past maybe, you know, five years there's a certain economic downturn where people are actually more interested in saving and, and consuming less in a way that I think is reflecting a certain paradigm shift in, in um, you know, uh, consumerism in a, in a way that could kind of benefit this idea of, uh, you know, green, sustainable living. You know, I mean, I think what's interesting about what you're talking about is, that is, is a way to change people's behaviors as a whole, and I don't think that really happens without certain uh, economic kind of um, pushes in a way. Like, people aren't going to be as concerned about um, you know, for example, right now, like people aren't concerned, people aren't, weren't as concerned about saving gas money until gas money became very expensive. So I think there's a uh, uh, gas, gas, gas mileage. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's sort of, um, I guess, to talk about maybe how you see your role fitting in with um, working with companies, kind of, you know, working with them and possibly, uh, I guess, like reflecting certain other kinds of, like, you know, maybe for what I'm trying to say is, would you see what you're doing now as as possible, uh, you know, 10 years ago, or do you think this is something that is kind of burgeoning as a as a more kind of contemporary um, phenomenon? And if that is so, you know, where you, where you maybe you see that heading? Yeah, well, the stuff I'm doing with companies definitely wasn't. I mean, I 10 years ago I described I wrote a book and I described Walmart as a virus that's come to basically destroy American companies and towns. So I, it's you know I, I don't have exactly the same feelings anymore. Um, uh, companies are changing, um, and what I would say is that we're kind of, the, the, those of us who are professionally invested in, in, in protecting the earth haven't changed quickly enough to meet them and match them and work alongside them uh, to do that. We still need lots and lots of people who are attacking capitalism, commerce, and really pushing, because that actually allows the opportunity to have a dialogue. But then once we're in that dialogue, we need to be really jujitsu masters and really help move them so they're still achieving their goals, which is making money and all that, um, and, and serving the communities that they serve and serving their employees as they see it, uh, but also achieves the, the ecological goals as well. I, I think though that I was really interested in, in your um, comments around that sort of, that, that view of back to the land, simplicity, frugality, because there are some very interesting um, streams we're seeing in, um, in folks. If you, for example, look at people who have modest incomes um, in the U.S. There's folks who are highly educated, um, environmentally oriented folks who have chickens, um, and there are people who are poorly educated, um, modest income who have chickens, um, and you know they have different social benefits of them. Some of them are I just you know I'm, I'm trying to add protein to my diet and it saves money, um, but you're more likely to find those very highly educated chicken owners as having a very strong higher purpose connection to it, right? This makes me a part of a global community. I'm doing this to serve in that way, which is an extraordinarily valuable thing to have. Um, it makes you want to keep the behavior going, so you're not just doing it until you can afford to buy a chicken or to buy eggs, um, but you do it because you value it and it's part of a community. And somehow we need to port that, that belief over to other, other folks too. Because what we find is that when you 
when you connect a higher purpose to what might be a, you know, a very simple activity, recycling a can, turning off a light, you not only continue that activity, but you feel better about yourself, and you begin to connect to all sorts of other things. And one of the challenges that people have right now in this very complicated society is just how to organize your life. You know, it's like when you, if you go and talk to people who are, who are living on the bubble, who don't have any savings, um, who have, uh, you know, um, who, who really are, you know, frightened, um, uh, and that's not just artists. Um, uh, you, what you hear is this challenge of how to organize these complicated, you know, from healthcare to childcare to, it's just, they're normal kind of activities. And they don't have the systems the way of organizing them, right? So it's, it's that sort of, that, that old saying, like, how do you get something done? You give it to the busiest person. The reason the busiest person can get it done is because they know how to get things done. And adding higher purpose to very basic acts gives them a system to actually get the next thing done. Uh, so there, there are some cultural interventions we can think about there, and I, I, I'd encourage you to keep on pushing on that. I don't, I don't know the answer, I just sort of have some hints around it. Um, sure. Uh, let's uh, take a couple questions in the audience. Um, What's your name? Oh, I'm sorry. Introduce yourself. Oh, okay. I'm Pam. Um, I just saw a great movie. This is not related to my question, but I thought I'd add it to the discussion, which is um, No Impact Man. <laughs> I really liked it. Um, and that kind of goes along the lines of degrowth. Um, but my main interest is in community involvement, and you kind of mentioned that earlier, about as a way to create change. Um, and I'm wondering if you can call upon or like mention any organizations or even businesses that are working around this to try and create um, awareness, education, and like provide some kind of activity or, you know, to build this new mindset? Um. Well, every, I mean, uh, you know, I, I have spent a lot of time, not bad-mouthing environmental groups, but saying that every, every environmental group that's survived is doing that to some extent now. So, um, uh, you know, a, as an example, one of the, the, the most vibrant programs at the Sierra Club is called Inner City Outings, um, Inner City Outings, where they, they in hundreds of, uh, uh, opportunities a year. They take kids from the city who don't get a chance just to get out and see nature. Um, and that experience of nature, um, you know, is, is transformative. Uh, and if you follow the kids, you get a chance to see nature and be a part of it and get out of urban spaces. It changes the way that they are um, and changes their prospects for the future. Um, so that's, that's a very um, literal um, uh, way of, of the way an organization can connect its core mission to it. Um, but um, uh, is there any particular type of that you're interested in, or? Yeah, I mean, because I, I live in Oakland, and, you know, I, so I live in an urban environment, and I'm really interested in um, trying to bring the community together in a way where, like, it's like a new town hall type mm -hmm. of idea, where we share ideas, and we share about what we do, and so I'm just kind of wondering if you've heard of other organizations doing the same thing, um, on that kind of community-based level. Yeah, I think it's less organizations than communities, if that makes sense. I mean, this is where, you know, what you needed for an organization before, um, which was kind of a leader to help identify people and connect them, the internet has, has disintermediated because it, you, can, you have better resources to organize your community very effectively now through the internet than the organizations who have the membership list do. Um, but I think the best examples are actually local food um, local food movements in Oakland um, all have been an incredible way to bring people together and to deal with a community issue um, and to, to build those relationships. The, the, the thing I would just say is that, you know, in my experience, gathering people together to gather them together um, is a really ineffective way of doing that. Um, and this happens on campuses all the time. They form a committee to form a group and they spend their entire time talking about their meetings and they meet about meetings, and then they have someone in charge of meetings. Um, maybe you know organizations like this too. Um, and, uh, and then people stop coming because why would they want to come to meet about meetings? Uh, uh, it's so much better to think about, let's you know, start a community garden and let's go garden it. 
you know, and there'll be some other conversations that happen because if I know my neighbors, then I know there's gonna be a stop sign in our corner and I know we're gonna deal with these other issues. It just sort of happens as a byproduct. And that's where it doesn't really matter what the core drawing together is, whether it's community food or community safety or um, arts or whatever it is. That's it. Thank this you. question here. Hi, uh, my name is Rebecca. Thanks for the talk. That's been a lot of uh, interesting things to think about. And I'm, I'm wondering if you could um, talk a little bit about what vision you have, or, or what place, if any, in your vision there is for environmental justice groups, not so much in the kind of positive community building, consensus building sense, but in a more kind of confrontational sense. You know, there are organizations that do have a very collective approach to environmentalism that is very humanist, and they're not really interested in behavior change at the level of consumers or individuals. The behavior change that they're trying to affect is corporations and polluters, you know, asserting an environmentalism that's much more about, you know, don't pollute over marginalized populations, mm -hmm. invest in public transportation so that people can get to their jobs, clean up those jobs so that they're not exposed to pollution on the job. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about, you know, what role those organizations have to play in what should be a really broad switch to sustainability for all people. Yeah. I, I think it's an incredibly important role. Uh, and I, I actually think the um, I kind of think there's two choices. Like you either, um, do you ever see that, was it, was it Independence Day, that Will Smith movie, um, where the president is looking at the alien. Um, are you with me here? No. Yeah. The president is looking <laughs> through the alien through a, a, a wall of glass and the alien is looking at him and they're mind meld. Um, and he goes, you know, what do you, <laughs> and the president goes, what do you want from us? And the alien goes, we want you to die. <laughs> uh, and that's, uh, that is, um, I could really relate to the alien um, because that is, was my view in many ways of the way that I prosecuted my environmental activism was that I was out to get the companies I was after. I was going to beat them into the ground until I got what I wanted. Um, someone else could go make the deal with, someone else could do, I don't get, and I'll attack them too. I'll attack anyone, right? But that my job was to make them to go <laughs> to their knees. Um, there's far too little of that right now as far as I'm concerned. I'm definitely in the place of, okay, let's make it work. Yeah, there's pressure. Yeah, I, I can tell you a hundred other things you need to get worried about. Let's go fix them. Let's talk about how we do that. Um, there's two people, in my mind, two people doing that. But there's, right now, we need more people pushing, hitting, demanding, and doing that. Um, environmental justice groups are, are, you know, one really important segment of that. Uh, and it's a very, you know, it's, from a strategic standpoint, it's an exposed flank of those companies. Uh, so I think it's really important. Uh, if that makes sense, I, I'm all for it. <clears throat> David. Oh, thanks. Um, so, Adam, I met you 12 years ago. Um, I'm David Harris, uh, and it was it was a great it was a great meeting because you were actually um, I think it was before you had started working with Walmart and working with companies. Um, and I think I read the place where you called uh, Walmart a virus that was attacking our country. Um, and you were actually thinking about politics back then as a way of making change, which was which was really exciting to me. Um, and I still remember that you recommended I read Fear and Loathing on the Campaign Trail, which was an, an excellent book. Um, and uh, yeah, so I kind of, I followed your career, I've followed since then for the last 12 years. Um, and it was, I actually went down a different path. I became an artist to try to use art as a means of affecting that cultural change that you were talking about. Um, but then when I started first hearing about your work with Walmart, um, it was really fascinating to me because I was thinking, how, you know, how, is he, how is he doing this and how is he thinking about um, you know, that relationship between the political change that you wanted to make before, doing it through the, the political system versus these corporations. And you know, I think it, it was a good idea probably at the point when you started doing it because it was a real low-hanging fruit. Like there were a lot of easy ways to make environmental uh, impact that save companies money. Right, and that act, or that make companies more money, but what I'm wondering is, like, have we exhausted um, that avenue for change? Like, are are we? That was kind of a duh. We can make more money. We can make a marketing campaign around it, so we can sell more stuff. Um, you know, are we getting to the end of that before we can stop climate change and save the Mojave Desert? Um, you know, and then, the, so the second part of my question, I was asked to talk about my art recently to a group of Procter & Gamble executives, uh, which was kind of weird for me and uncomfortable. Um, and I did it, and I talked to them, and I kept thinking afterwards, like, should I really have done that? Like, um, 
you know, do, and then the question I kept asking myself is, um, would I care if Procter & Gamble went bankrupt tomorrow? Like, would the world be a better place if, if they went bankrupt tomorrow? And, and, you know, there are a lot of jobs that would be lost and that would be really bad for a lot of people, but uh, I'm, st I'm not sure, I, I'm, so I'm curious. Um, you know, do you still think about politics as a way of making change? Do you think we've exhausted sort of the low-hanging fruit that I think you've, you've harvested a lot of? And w would you be sad tomorrow if Walmart or Procter & Gamble went bankrupt? <laughs> <laughs> wow, good questions. Um, uh, have we exhausted the, you know, I, I worry about this. I really, and it's, I mean, it's why I'm here right now. I, frankly, uh, I'm just, you know, I, I have, um, invested in, my, in becoming an expert in corporate change. Uh, and you know, if you had asked me five years ago where we'd be at today, I would have guessed much further. Um, you know, I would, I would guess that it would be a, a greater material change in the actual environment not just in people's um, bottom lines and reduction in waste. There's all, those are all good things, but they haven't added up to slow climate change. Um, you know, in the end, it will need to be, uh, moving on to your second question, political. You know, there will need to be a, uh, a, a legislative um, uh, vote uh, globally at some, in some context, in some forum, to reduce our use of carbon. You know, that, that's gonna be, that will be a big part of it. Um, uh, and it'll probably need to be innovation that drives that. Because if you even take all the technology we have today, it's not enough to get to the level of carbon reduction we have to have to have a survivable planet. So, you know, it's, it's, politics will be a part of it that can incent it, that can fund the research and development we need. I mean, we should be putting 15 to $20 billion a year into basic science and research so that we can be learning about um, kind of these next generation clean energy technologies that will allow us to live here, not on, on the moon, but right here. Uh, so I think that's some part, politics and science, you know, and, and, and innovation. You know, whether I think those companies should die um, or would I be sad if I, I probably, I probably would be sad. I, I actually really do believe in their innovation at this point. Um, I think they should probably change form. They should be attacked. They should move. Um, but they do have an important role to play. Here, here's the challenge, right? We need, we live on a controlled system you know, Bill McKibben wrote this book in, God, it was probably 89, uh, called The End of Nature, where he said that there is no longer any nature on the planet. And if Henry David Thoreau were alive today, he would, he would be unable to be a transcendentalist because he would look at a tree and try to transcend it because it was something not human that he would be able to, you know, go into his, his zone and think about other things. And he couldn't because even that tree has been affected by humanity. Even that tree in the farthest um, realm of, 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 of Alaska and the, the Arctic has been affected by ozone depletion or climate change. So that is essentially human as well. Everything on the planet is essentially human, has been affected by us, consciously or not. We have affected, we have changed this place. So there is not nature anymore. There is a garden that we are the gardeners of. And regardless of what your spiritual bent is and what you think that, that, that a deity, God, manages, humans have inserted ourselves as the gardener on the planet. So if we're on a gardened earth, what tools do we have to garden that earth? We don't have a political system that can do it. I mean, not, not even close. The United Nations isn't going to do it. We don't have uh, national governments. I mean, China, the United States, they're not leading us into that. You know, what we do have is multinational companies that have to trade over those borders and have to figure out things so that they can actually do commerce. So that's a, that's a tool. And then we have these cultures that drive, that drive us, that pull us together, that pull us apart, that connect us. And that's another you know, flow around the planet, just like water and air. So uh, I'm, you know, I'm fascinated by what that might be. And largely because you know, I'll, I'm, I'm gonna move on if it doesn't work. You know? And I'm, I'm definitely a little frustrated with my own work in companies. Uh, and if it doesn't work the next thing, I'll move on to the next thing after that. I don't know, I'm just. So let me, I wanna, <laughs> we're gonna need to take a break here for a minute, but I'm, um, this is really fascinating. I, I, for many years, done, done a lot of work in the uh, performing arts world, in particular around advocacy, right? Mm -hmm. Which was all about sort of fighting for the survival of the NEA. And we would always look to the environmental movement and say, how did they do it? How did, suddenly everybody cares about the environment. Nobody cares about the art, but suddenly everybody cares about the environment. How did the environmental movement do that? How did they make that happen? And what I hear you saying is that 
um, irrespective of whether the environmental movement actually did that or not, you're looking at a, a, a moving forward in a more diverse way, if you will, to say that um, these things, which we've just been talking about, all vital, all part of the conversation. But if we really want to address the sort of deep ecological existential moment, it really, art and culture needs to be at the heart of that because of the values, because of what art and culture represents in terms of values, how it speaks to people on that value level, and that that values shift is going to be core to all the other sort of stuff that is that also does have to go the yell the you know the uh, the anger and the going after the companies and the um, uh, all of that stuff that we've just been talking about needs to be, but beneath that has to be this sort of cultural shift in terms of how we how we how we think about it mm -hmm. right how we yeah and probably a lot less literal probably a lot less polemical probably a very different thing I mean this we're still going to have this role for for you know, specific advocates to advocate, right, you know, and to right, pass that piece of right. legislation, get people elected and all, that's right. But I think actually how we communicate with each other, what those social movements are, I think that's all up for grabs yeah, right yeah. now. And I mean, a lot of the, the dissatisfaction that seems current in our world is, is because of a, the, the um, heightened expectations that cap and trade will solve this problem and then it doesn't. Right. Healthcare legislation will solve this problem and then it doesn't. And we're like trying right. to solve the problem with tools that aren't capable of solving the problem. Right. I, I really take your point about the political piece. And so then what, with your work, you're seeing yourself in one of these arenas yeah. where you're working to work in within that arena to try to affect that change. And we are working in another arena that needs to be more present with the conversation. I, I think so. And, you know, we spoke a little bit earlier about this. You know, there, there is there is this ongoing argument about what's the, what is the role of social activism in art, you know, right, how, right. how literal can that be, when does it become, make it bad art, that, you know, that, and I, I think sometimes we have to sort of pass, you know, sort of move on beyond that. I'm not, I'm just really not interested in, in um, kind of the silly intellectual arguments about it. Right. You know, I just, you know, we're humans, we live on this earth, and how, it, my experience is that, that, that every artist works with the material that they're that surrounds them. Right. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, what I like about this conversation is that we're foregrounding something. You know, if there's something useful, great. If not, you know. It's great. Okay, we're going to take, it's 2.35, so we'll take 10 minutes. We'll come back at 2.45, and then we'll set up the second half of the day in terms of the small groups and get um, some more deep participation here. Thank you, Adam. Thanks.
So it doesn't have to be ecological protection, but maybe it's just of common spaces and how do we kind of protect even just like the cultural norms that go around it. So event spaces, public parks, how do you kind of protect sort of what is there from maybe outside forces or change? Well, so the first thing I think about is like, if you take any space, you have to decide like what's important to protect within that space, and that's not generally a shared value, right? So like, I'd kind of be interested in first figuring out like who has what values and what premiums within a given space, and like who thinks what needs to be protected. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But then if it's something like a bike lane, like, mm -hmm. then how does that work with regards to that? In certain areas of, you know, the idea of a space that belongs to the cyclist. Mm -hmm. I would be just wondering what regards to that. Yeah. Or the Wi-Fi, I guess. How, does that, how is that space determined? Yeah, I don't know. So what do you value in a bike lane? I'm not a biker, but maybe like it being clear of debris, that's something I would value as a biker who's using it. But it's also tends to be shared space because motorists are often near or on top of the bike lane and have to kind of, they have to work. What else would you value? Does anybody have a biker? I ride in the bike lane all the time. Yep. And <laughs> in my, on my bike, not on my bike. Yeah. Um, and I value the um, the new bike lanes on Market Street that are sort of set more apart from the cars. That's really mm -hmm. nice. Um, and I value um, shared lightness amongst bikers. You know, because some bikers go faster and others go slower. So. What? Mm -hmm. park in Lincoln and then walk to the park. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of a bizarre notion that you only need park as, you know, as big as it is, you have to drive yeah. inside. Well, so, uh, but they've been trying to stop that for years, but yeah. it's a million people that want to drive through it. There, there is something interesting about paved, some paved sections. So, I went to visit a remote national park a couple years ago, and there was a trail, like, I mean, so remote, high up in the mountains, and there was, this almost made me cry, a trail for people who were um, disabled. And so there was a beautiful paved and then tastefully through the woods like, and I'm like, here, so here's a way for somebody who could never have gotten, like, Access. couldn't, they were able, and you could drive up to it and go there and go. So like, when you talk about, you know, sort of, access for all people there is there is an interesting way to balance you know those who, who need to have some paved access to places how do you keep the integrity of some of the, the wildness but also let people go see it who, who might not be able to go there or who are elderly you know there, there are other other reasons it's like a, a lot of things you could do are kind of prohibited by the fact that of liability uh, like you could somehow take the liability issues out of people's involvement with doing things, then you could actually have more participatory kinds mm -hmm. of activities, and you could have markets. And, I mean, things that would, would actually encourage people to follow their own, you know, get their own. Uh, start a victory garden. Victory garden <laughs> or markets of, of various you know, yeah. markets for culture, for CDs, for yeah. LPs. Yeah. Or, you know, I mean, basically things yeah. that draw people into kind of uh, interacting mm -hmm. with each other. In a small scale, you know. Mm -hmm. So, so I mean, it seems like one of the things that's really important is we define what protection is in this case. Because, just using that mm -hmm. example, mm -hmm. are we protecting the accessibility for all? That leads us down one mm -hmm. paved, paved, accessible path. Mm -hmm. Versus, are we protecting the longevity of the park or preserving it in a certain state? So, so maybe the first thing we need to do. And admittedly, I, I just got here and I've only been looking at this through Twitter today, <laughs> so, so I may be lacking context, but it seems like one of the key things is to define what we're protecting or what our goals are in, in, in protecting. Um, is it protecting the current state? Is it protecting that everyone is accessible and thus protecting against commercialization or, or perhaps losing some public control of it? Uh, or are we protecting the longevity of it, which might say, hey, we want less use. 
because if we open it up to say school field trips all the time, then that's going to wear down things more. There's going to be more wear and tear on, on things that are there now. So, do do we have a, a framework for what um, what what our protecting what our goals are in protecting? Yeah, I think Scott, if I'm thinking about the baby. That's one way of regulating the performance, right, is to create this rule. So in this car you can talk, in this car you can't talk. If somebody is in the wrong car and they're talking and they're not supposed to be, you know, there's an implied assumption, well, then you need to go in the car that you can talk. Similarly, if you want quiet and you're in the car where people are allowed to talk, it's like, well, you have no cause to be because there's a... So, but if the question is, is there... So regulation is very clear, right? And it can be all the way up to laws, which you throw it in jail, and, is there another way to, to manage that that's not about regulation? And what's the, what are the cultural parts of that? What cultural uh, uh, strategies could we employ that would... So for example, instead of having a rule, suppose you had the two cars, and one car was very dimly lit, and, and, and it's very, and there's like soft music playing, there's a, there's a lot of visual and oral cues to tell you this is not a place to talk on your cell phone. Right? And the other car has like multiple outlets for you to plug in and it's Wi-Fi is screaming. Or whatever. <laughs> so again, there's like visual cues and oral cues that are, that are affecting your behavior, that are, that are communicating. So. Yeah, it's about also personal yeah. choice, like collective, social, good. Right. 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 Buses, right? Just take a bus from New York to Vermont that had televisions throughout the bus. And they basically, well, they were video and they were just like, you know. Right. And, and it wasn't on, it, you had to listen to it and you had to watch it. And I used to, you know, basically stop using that bus television because there was no way for me to have the kind of experience I wanted with that bus code. Um, and so, no up down feature. No up down feature. <laughs> um, so anyway, I, they thought um, there's an assumption that people would want to watch that. Yeah. Just like in the airport, there's an assumption that you want to watch the television. And you know how challenging it is to get away from it. You're like really wiped out and tired from traveling a long time to build up. So, the, and you know, in a, I've read an essay or an article that said 90, when people were asked, 90% of the people said they wanted these things in the airport. Well, how about if I'm a minority? And I'm like, the 10%. Then how do I, you know, how does my, what I want? You know, how do I negotiate those spaces? And how am I taken care of in those spaces by the people who are so, have you ever had had an experience where, like, you're in a space and something like that, the TV's on, and you notice like no one is really watching it, and um, and so it, I, I mean, in situations like that, you know, I like ask my space sharers like can we turn off the TV? You know, and everybody says yes. And so, like, I'm wondering what kind of ways could, can you create, you know, dialogue, or how do you get consensus, and how do you check in with people about <laughs> your environment, and how do we come as, as a group to, you know, understanding of what, what's okay and not, what's not okay. I like the thought because what I was hearing before, all the solutions were getting to segregation and you choose the car that fits your needs, whether um, you're forced to or you're deciding to, and, and that's getting more to those are, are we really, yeah, but are our desires all really all that action. different or are there ways for us to come together more? Um, and not that we're always going to agree, but you know, if there's, you know, even if there was some sense of, you know, for this, um, for this stretch of time or for, you know, whatever the bound is, it's going to be one way, and then later it's another way. Is that some kind of construct that helps people stay together through both sorts of environments? Or, no, no, no. or are there other ways of managing the differences without separation? Your original scenario was actually in a neighborhood.
neighborhood? Is that what you were originally thinking? I was originally thinking, yeah, you're on a quiet street, some, you know, loud car comes by with the bass booming and, you know, shakes all the windows and, you know, just, you know, just sort of disrupts the tranquility. Um, but, you know, but that's obviously my bias of feeling like I don't want that. Um, and certainly it's different if it's happening nonstop versus happening once in a while. And, you know, and obviously the person in the car is, um, isn't doing it to annoy me, I think, but it's, you know, doing it because, you know, they get some value out of that, and, and I need to respect that as well. Um, so there's, if there's a dialogue, we can maybe come to some kind of space like that. When there isn't, then um, I just feel annoyed. But it, so, <laughs> so if, we, if we think about this place as a, as a commons, as complex as a commons, it really the only thing that's creating it as a commons is the presence of people. Mm -hmm. So the destruction of the commons is the absence of people, right? So what we're really trying to do is make it a place where people want to be. And so it's like, how do you provide for happiness? How do you provide for community? And how do you keep that going? I think that's the biggest threat to our commons. Mm -hmm. Um, and inside that commons, there's like a finite amount of space, right? In terms of personal space and public space, um, a finite amount of resources. And so, what is it about our typical living models and desires that would cause that commons to break down? What, what would be? You mean in a good way or a bad in way? In a bad way. What would cause the commons to break down in our typical behavior that we can see? Taking advantage of the space to your own personal use. And now be more way. And annoying ways. Uh, being mean to your neighbors. Being, being, being mean to marking on the wall. Leaving trash. <laughs> leaving yeah. trash. Putting gum under the table. Gum under the table. And other people's <laughs> tables. Yeah, you can do that at home. <laughs> yeah, all right. We got the barbecue table. <laughs> Leaving only your footprint. <laughs> Not a real footprint, <laughs> you know. <laughs> markers. Uh, that could be kind of presence. Can you sit on the counter? I mean, every, everything is annoying to somebody, you know, so that's hard. It's my roommate's son. Well, why would we not so like it, though? I mean, you mentioned that it'd be terrible to live there. What is it that. Right. How do you define terrible there? I think that, I mean, I think that those places are normally in. You know, suburban culture, their suburban settings, which I I personally find really alienating. Mm -hmm. um, and I think because they usually exist in areas that have like very strong car culture. And so when you have a really strong car culture, you wake up, you go to your garage, you get in your car, and you go to work, yeah. and all that interaction in between there mm -hmm. is completely gone. Yeah. You don't interact with the people you don't see. So maybe one way to make our weird combo condo complex very sustainable is to have it in a way that it is like very, very much removed from car culture. So let's remove from car culture. That'll some, make our so, so <laughs> landscape <laughs> around it. Like, well, no, like let it. Yeah. Well, I think that's adding commerce within the, you know, sort of like creating a small village. Yeah. Like, you know, so instead of driving to your supermarket, you walk to your supermarket. Your condo is there too, but you have all these interactions. In yeah, so making it not a weirdo, like have it be a place that is removed from car culture. Or, like, or also having minimal personal space, you know, because like the add-on of the garage, you know, really cut down on <laughs> good social behavior, you know, if you don't interact with your neighbors. We don't even need garages. Yeah, I can garage. Um, I have to say one of the, I'm sorry, I, one of the things that that, I, that bothers me the most about these architectural structures are the materials being used. They're terrible. They're, they, they actually repel calm experiences. You know, they're usually faux, stucco, kind of in terrible colors. Um, I th so I think in some sense, is there a way to change the facing? of our apartment complex, you know, so that we so, interface yeah, with it so, better. Because totally. the things that start to suck is when, like, the stucco gets stained from, like, water leaks or it gets mm -hmm. cracked or, like... Cracked because it's thin and the cheap. aluminum windows start getting really crappy. The aluminum so windows. Maybe, so maybe you're allowed to choose your your dream house. Everyone's allowed to choose the facade of their dream house and then all of it gets built together. So it's just like... So it's like... Yes, yes. 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 
So there should be a, and a bit of all, uh, some Wait, facelift we should be able to do independently of each other and at the same time it can add a kind of diverse exploration of our own attitudes on how we want our dwellings to be. Like getting rid of all the carpet if you want carpet floors, for instance. You know, or linoleum or things that you might not want. Over time, you know, regulations and laws get put into place to support that. Um, so, I mean, I think with smoke, it's so interesting because um, the tobacco companies were such a strong lobby. You know, to overcome that powerful lobby meant that a lot of other people were, you know, being able to put statistics out there, create fact sheets, people. And it's a generation. I mean, it really took a generation for that shift to happen um, because of you know, how educating young people in it affected a change in their behavior as they became young adults. So I wonder, like, just thinking about that issue in particular, um, it's like California, right? We lead the way with that. We go anywhere, basically, that's not California, and that's certainly not the case. I mean, that people are reformed in their behavior, and it's certainly at the international level, too. So um, I think it's interesting about the people that, uh, you know, we certainly have the audience play in innovation, um, not only with social norms, but also in the arts and, um, in, you know, business and commerce and, um, I don't know, just, you know, like how, and just even how at a, a small community level, you know, I mean, and here in San Francisco, as, uh, you know, banning the plastic bag and all the variety, you know, curbside composting, um, you know, we're so lucky to have these things and, uh, and hopefully this little neighborhood change we see as this neighborhood will, you know, ripple to uh, across the world. And so I think that's part of it too, is this idea of the small change in the community um, that can affect the bigger global scene. I think what I'm kind of hearing in all the sort of destructively in a sense, but then also it's one of the last like really All right, time, time of forces inside of it. Three, three more minutes. Three, three more minutes. Three, three more minutes. That's how our brains work. So, so I don't make sure there's one thing you can report out here. <laughs> you can be able to define what the comments is. Should just split up with the board <laughs> and just disrupt <laughs> everyone else. <laughs> solutions to know. <laughs> we're talking about culture, we're talking about what's beyond, what's behind culture. Let's say the community garden infringed on the culture. There are people who are, that's the most important thing to them and they will make a lot of noise and, and it's, I don't know, it's one of the interesting things about living in this area. We can always go back to democracy where the majority makes maybe a different so, Then it's a whole marketing battle to get your, <laughs> all, your, all your voices together. So, shall we wrap yeah, up? how do we, how should we like sum up? I don't know, actually. Yeah, <laughs> you so no, you could. I don't even know what I'm supposed to say. <laughs> Let's review it. Just say what you Yes. Want. You can practice by reading back to us. <laughs> okay, here we go. <laughs> is this thing on? Um, Golden Gate Park is our commons. Um, <laughs> Just <that>. Discuss. <laughs> yes. That's it. Um, we're interested in, what are we talking about? Okay, so there are a lot of, a lot of challenges to protecting it. There's this rampant deforestation, there's commercial interests who are buying for um, exposure and things like that. Um, we want to minimize the damage and, and uh, traffic that is vehicular, that is risks um, threatening, similar to the desert 
issue that, that Adam was talking about that, that risks spoiling it just because of the, the exposure, which is like kind of a catch-22. Um, and also the, the major, the, the one of the question that Michael, you brought up is, is what, what exactly is we mean by protection? I mean, preserving access to the park or, or keeping it as pristine as possible for as long as possible? Um, What is the function of a park in general? Mm -hmm. um, what is what, what was the intention of it when it was developed? Who knows how many decades ago? Um, and then how has the cultural context shifted in the 21st century? How can we revisit um, what what's useful for for our community now that's different from when Olmsted designed it to increase people's um, ownership or, or perceived value of, of the park and how it can be relevant for everybody? fostering stewardship, um, intergenerational stewardship of the park to, to create a new generation of people who realize its value.